see it. Yes? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Perfect. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be to be here. Um, of course, I mean, um, um, I, I guess you know that. I mean, just uh, watching the headline of, of my my lecture, returning to the region of wine with centennial centennial earthware amphora. I, I guess you know what we are going to talk about, uh, which is about the, the impact of of this kind of of winemaking in 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 the wines, the properties of of those wines uh, fermented and aged in in this earthenware amphora. But uh, furthermore, I would like to to stress on on the change in our philosophy and culture in the winery. I mean, uh, making the wine in Centennial Earthenware Amphora uh, has to do more with um, our values. It's a way in some way to concrete at extreme level our philosophy in Prado Rey rather than uh, maybe a fashion or a trend that because at this moment we are also watching many people doing different uh, elaborations of, of wine and in, in different parts of the world. And I think this is amazing, but we are taking this really seriously. Um, maybe if we, if we think about the wine business a couple of, of centuries ago, uh, it was easy to to imagine or well, uh, in the end, every, every, everyone know that um, there were many wineries in lots of villages and, and it was common that those owners of of these wineries were elaborating uh, wines with their own grapes. Um, and, and in the end, I mean, maybe three, four neighbors joined together to make a winery, to, to make some wine with their vines. But in the end, and the best example maybe is France, we can see that Pauliac and Saint Julien, they are six kilometers far from one village to another, but the wines were completely different. But in the 20th century, um, when the, the wine business, the wine industry became bigger and bigger, and there were some wine appellations renowned everywhere in the world, uh, it was common also to see these this, uh, small wineries at the beginning were, were growing and buying some grapes at different places, in, uh, of course, maybe in their appellation, but from different villages. And the goal was, in some way, uh, to standardize the wine. Um, and it was also a challenge because they were mixing grapes from different places, perhaps, and and they knew this this these grapes were going to to turn into different wines. But when they mixed together, they wanted to to have a similar wine. Uh, I mean, uh, pretending in some way or or, or trying in some way uh, that if you drink a bottle of some brand in, in New York, the taste the tasting should be similar uh, as if you taste that same brand perhaps in Madrid, for instance. Um, that had a good point from my personal point of view, because nowadays it's very difficult to find a bad wine in the market. Almost all wines are very, very good. But on the other side, for me, uh, this strategy brought a, a, a dark side, which is most of the wine in the market nowadays are very similar, at least if we talk about uh, a, concrete, uh, a certain uh, wine appellation. So why we are, why we are using this Decentennial Earthenware Amphora? Because for us, in some way, the best way to 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 innovate, to make, to carry out a, a research and development strategy in wine is coming back to the past and trying to stress on those things which really makes a difference. Uh, talking about the terroir, because in the end, uh, we think in Prado Rey that the only thing that makes a difference is the terroir. I mean, we can buy similar oaks, even same oaks. We can. Uh, I mean, those, those wineries who buy industrial yeast can use the same industrial yeast. And in the end, what makes a difference, as I was trying to explain, is, is your soil, is your terroir, is your climate. And it, this is not because it is, it is uh, better than the other, it's, it is because it's yours. I mean, um, this is what we're trying to do in Prado, we're trying to do in Prado Rey. Prado Rey is a big winery in Spain, a big winery in Rivera del Duero. We, we are, but we are just one of the few wineries in the whole appellation that we just use our own grape. And this is, I mean, trying to make the wine in this kind of amphora is a way to stress on these properties of, of our terroir. So, uh, first of all, before, um, I mean, going deeper in this part of, 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 of wine making in, in uh, clay amphoras, I would like to explain a little bit about who we are. So, we are Prado Rey, as I was trying to explain before. I don't know whether you know much of Spanish, but Prado Rey means King's Meadow. And this is because we are in a very special place. We are in a royal site. A royal site in Spain, in Spain is not something that you can name yourself. You have to be named by the king. 
And in 1503, there was a very important queen in Spain, Isabella of Castile, Isabella the Catholic, the one who finally Christopher Columbus trip to America, uh, that she fell in love with this place and she bought it uh, for the Spanish crown. In fact, it was sounded by the Spanish crown for centuries. And uh, this is why since 1503, we are a royal site. This is something that you can see here, Real Sitio, since 1503. And one century later, there was uh, an important king in Spain called Philip III, who really loved to come to our, to, to our state for hunting. And there was a wonderful meadow, his favorite meadow, where he used to sit down to read and for sure to, to, for, for hunting. And this, this, this meadow was called El Prado del Rey, the, the, El Prado Rey, the King's Meadow. Uh, Philip III was an interesting king in Spain because, uh, I mean, he, he was uh, the king of the gold, Spanish Golden Age in terms of culture. And it was very common to, 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 to receive in our, in our palace, the palace you can see here in this picture, people like Rubens, the Dutch painter, or, or writers like uh, Cervantes, uh, the author of Quixote, or even uh, Lope de Vega, one of the most renowned Spanish writers in, 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 the, in our history. Uh, this, this palace nowadays is a lodge where you can stay if you, can, you, if you visit us. It will be a pleasure to, to receive you there. But don't worry, we are not going to talk about uh, year by year in the 17th century. We will go straight to the 20th century. This person here uh, to the right is my grandfather, Javier Clemades Dadaro. He bought this royal estate in, in 1989 and he grew again the vines because they had, be, uh, they had been pulled uh, the, in, the, in the first part of the 20th century because of the, of the cold in, in the area. And he had a dream, which was to, to produce a, a world-class wine in Rivera del Duero. Uh, nowadays, Rivera del Duero is a very renowned area. I mean, uh, we could say that Rivera del Duero is a case or, or it's a history of success. But when my grandfather bet for this area, for this appellation, it wasn't that clear. We are talking that there were only 15 wineries in the whole appellation. Nowadays, we are almost 300. And he grew the biggest extension ever uh, grown in Rivera del Duero of, of, of found vines. Uh, of course, our previous years, our first Pado Rey was in 1996. We were the inventors of the category Roble in Spain. So this is an example of those, I mean, the standardized wines I was trying to explain before. Uh, in 2006, we also produced our first white wine, Prado Rey Verdejo, another standardized wine, in this case, from the area of Rueda. But in 2014, we, we made a huge change. We made a, a, an enological revolution and we started to turn the vines into organic. We started to use just uh, indigenous yeast, spontaneous fermentation. And uh, these 520 hectares, nowadays we have 540 that we had those days, were split it into, well, they were, my grandfather split them into eight plots. Nowadays we have nine, but we divided these eight plots into 131 micro terroirs. Of course, we are not producing 131 wines. This would be a, a madness, but we are producing nowadays 16 wines. I don't know whether you know much about Rivera del Duero, but the, the typical winery maybe has a young wine or roble. A Crianza, a Reserva, a Gran Reserva, maybe a signature wine, perhaps a Rosé, five, six wines. We're producing 16 different wines with different, uh, from different soils. We have uh, micro, uh, micro terroir wine. We have uh, wines from single vineyards. We have, of course, a mix of different plots, but uh, stressing on what we can get from the grapes. And in addition, all the work we started to do in the winery were, were focused on what we wanted to achieve from these grapes. Of course, we, we needed to take lots of time uh, researching about our soil, our history climate data, uh, and to understand better what we had in, in some parts of our, of our terroir. It was surprising for us to, to discover that there were some areas that we were, they were thought they weren't so good, but they were very good for certain kind of wines. And following this, this change, in 2016, we started using clay amphoras for producing our wines. Uh, I will talk about I will talk about this this bottle, El Buen Alfarero, later. But it was a, a milestone in our history, as I will explain later. And I think that uh, maybe that the, the, when the people realized that we were going seriously with that was in 2019, when we stopped producing Roble, we were selling one million bottles of that wine, and we started producing Origen, which is a young wine, but instead being aged 
I mean, just in, in oaks. Uh, there is a part of, of this wine that doesn't uh, stay a single layer in oaks. And it's just aged in, in, in clay and for us. So it was, I mean, it, it, we weren't talking, as I told you before, about a fashion, about a trend, but something really seriously, which was uh, profoundly linked with our philosophy in the, in the winery. So this is our estate. I mean, uh, well, as I was, as the biggest, uh, the, the biggest estate in the north of Spain. We are talking about 3,000 hectares. We have the biggest uh, vineyard in Ribera del Duero, 545 right now. With this, uh, well, this new plot called Los Quemados, which has been just uh, grown a couple of years ago. Um, at this moment, we have a project of growing another 100 hectares, in which we are we are going to try to recover. Uh, all varieties from Ribera del Duero, more than Tempranillo, that they are almost in danger of extinction. And this is very important also for, for us to recover these this, uh, old grapes that at this moment, I mean, uh, nobody is, is, is growing in, in, in Ribera del, del Duero. But of course, in this big farm, we have much more than, than, than grapes. I mean, we have uh, poplars, we have uh, corn, we have potatoes. Uh, uh, we have every, we, we produce everything with, with renewable energies. In the 19th century, there was a built a dam uh, where we produce hydroelectric uh, energy, a uh, power. Sorry, uh, we have also a photovoltaic uh, power station, and we have also some cows when we produce fresh milk, some uh, sheep to produce our cheese, and of course, tourism is very important for us, as you can see here in our in our lodge, the former palace of the, of the king. Uh, the harmony between the, the this model, this this uh, winemaking, this uh, kind, I mean, this 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 uh, farm business uh, with with nature, with sustainability, is a key point for us. And this is something that my grandfather always stressed on that. Uh, and this is why also we are turning, as I told you before, this this uh, our vines into into organic. And this is, I mean, the, the, the you can see here better the, the estate. I mean, in terms of 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 the uh, of our plots of, of vines, you can find here some uh, micro terroir wines like Elite or Buen Alfarero, for instance, or or single vineyard wine like Finca La Mina or, or Finca Val de la Yegua or Benadaro. So, I mean, different wines from different parts of our estates, from uh, Val de la Yegua to Salguero, we have more than seven kilometers of difference. And this is uh, the Luero River, and this is the Gromejón River. So we could say that we are in the heart of the of Ribera del Duero Appellation. And also the average of altitude is very high. You have to understand that Peñafiel, which was called the Golden Mile of Ribera del Duero, the average of altitude is 720 meters. And we are about uh, 813 in average, but we have different uh, plots, as for instance, uh, Salguero or El Ollo de Ornajo which are about 850, which is very, very high for, for Rivera del Duero. This, this winter, we have been at 20 degrees below zero in, in, in our winery. So we are in the most extreme climate area of, of, of Rivera del Duero. So uh, let's go. What about our wines and why uh, this issue of, 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 of uh, earthenware uh, amphora? Well, we want to produce excellent wines, of course. This is very, very important, but we want to produce wines with soul. And in terms of that, we just, I mean, uh, of course, you have to start uh, in, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the vines. I mean, with a, an appropriate um, um, agriculture. I mean, I mean, uh, with, uh, uh, I mean, it, in addition, we have three different harvests every harvest. And we treat, uh, we customize the, the treatments of, of, of the grapes, of the plots, on the, of the micro terrace, depending on the wine we want to, to make. But in addition of that, I mean, you have to be bold. You have to have an attitude to explore your own limits, to, to, to explore the limits of Rivera del Duero. We have some wines, for instance, that <laughs> we have been invited to, <laughs> to release them out of Rivera del Duero appellation. This is the case of El Cuentista, the, the unique Blanc de Noir Sever in Rivera del Duero. But uh, it didn't have its own place in the, in the appellation of Rivera del Duero. And to be bold and to be exploring your limits is not only about looking forward at or trying to to research about new new ideas, but also to look uh, back and to learn from your traditions. And 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 one of these traditions for us was this uh, to elaborate wines in this clay for us. And this is uh, how we started. I mean, one day. I mean, well, sorry. The, 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 I mean, the the, the um, wine making in clay for us is something which is. Uh, maybe, uh, well, of course, it's very, very, uh, very old, very antique, but I mean, 
is more has been more more common than we could expect. I mean, until the middle of the 20th century, there were at least in Spain there were more clay amphoras. There more there were more uh, wine in clay amphoras than in oaks, or of course than in than in in, in metal tanks or inox tanks. Um, in in Spain at this moment, it's, this is really a pity. There were lots of them uh, which were abandoned. And uh, what we did was some, some archaeology to look for, for them. But everything started with a, with a question. This is our winemaker, uh, Francisco Martin. Um, well, he's a very interesting, uh, interesting guy. He's an agriculture engineer. He also studied uh, winemaking enology in, in, in Spain at university. But he has to do more with an um, with artist than with a technician. And I have always thought that uh, to have uh, Francisco happy in our company, one of my tasks was to give him some freedom uh, to create, to innovate, to try to do different things. Of course, sometimes we, we, we commit mistakes, but uh, something I have to, to, to tell, and I'm, and I'm very proud for that, that in any, mis in any mistake we have committed, Fran has learned the lesson and has found new ideas for improving the, the wine. So in 2016, one day he was walking surrounding the lodge and we have there an, an old centenary, an old centennial, sorry, a clay amphora just for furnishing, not for producing wine. And suddenly he thought, um, why, why, don't we, why don't we make a wine like our ancestors used to, to do? I mean, we, in, in clay amphoras. And he came to, to my office in the winery and he told me, Fernando, I would like to do this. And I told him, okay, uh, let's go. He told me he wanted just to, to look for 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 uh, clay amphoras, centennial, centennial clay amphoras. And I thought, I mean, the risk was limited. And it, I thought it was going to be a good idea. If we were, if we succeeded, uh, it, I mean, um, if we succeed, sorry, um, I knew that it was going to have a huge hint impact in our stakeholders, in our customers, in, 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 I mean, among the journalists in Spain. But if we fail, I thought, I mean, once more, we were, there will be, there will be uh, something that we could learn about. So we, we decided to go ahead and we did it. I mean, uh, or I told he, and I told Fran that if we wanted to do that, we, we needed to be radical and to be radical was to make the wine like it was made, uh, I mean, lots of years ago. Of course, we uh, forgot about the hopper. We forgot about, uh, I mean, mm, squeezing the, the, the grapes in with, in with mechanical tools. I mean, we just thread the, the grapes in, in, in the traditional style. Uh, we plunge the, the grapes also uh, in a handmade style and we make the alcoholic fermentation. We select four different micro terroirs for each uh, of these four clay amphoras in 2016. We made alcoholic fermentation spontaneously without controlling temperature. And once the, the alcoholic fermentation finished, we removed the seeds, we removed the, the skin, we let the wine to make their, uh, in the clay amphoras, the malolactic fermentation. And, uh, and uh, we just, when the malolactic fermentation finished, uh, left the wine there for six, seven, eight months we were tasting the wine uh, almost every week. We, we were making some analytics every week to, to see how was the wine evolving. And, and I think it was yeah, in March or in April, more or less, that when we realized that there was one, one of these clay amphoras, the, the one who had some, some wine from a single uh, a micro terroir from the Eloyo Dornajo, that it was like, wow, we have here really something, something special. And we decided to uh, send the wine to, to Peñin, which is the most renowned wine journalist in Spain. And they phoned us and they told us, okay, uh, guys, you have something special. You have a wine with soul. And this wine is going to be named as one of the um, racing star wines in Spain this, this year. This was very touching for us because we had never been considered for such an, uh, an amazing uh, prize. Um, and we, we, I mean, we were in a hurry releasing the wine to the market because, because many people who was working with this kind of, of clay amphoras told us that these wines used to evolve very, very quickly. And so we bottled it, we released to the market, uh, the journalists and, and even the, the winemakers from other companies were astonished because, I mean, perhaps was our most Ribera Duro wine because we didn't use 
oak in, in, in aging or fermenting the wine, but in the end, in, in, when you tasted the wine, it had little to do with other Ribera del Dueros. Uh, and it was something that uh, it was very interesting for us. So this was El Buen Alfarero, uh, a very, very, very uh, interesting wine. But uh, maybe the most important thing happened one year and a half later. One day we were in the winery, Fran and me, uh, Francisco, the winemaker and me, tasting the wines. And we opened a bottle of this uh, 2016 Buen Alfarero. And we compared it with some uh, Finca Lamina Reserva 2016. We compared with the following uh, vintage of El Buen Alfarero 2017. And we realized that that wine was not evolving quicker. In fact, it was evolving slower than the wines aged in oaks. And in addition, uh, I mean, the color was more, more alive. The, the, the flavor and the aromas were more primary. Uh, we, we found lots of freshness and it wasn't that common because uh, it was expected that that wine uh, had to evolve, as I told you before, quicker than other wines from, from Ribera del Duero. And this was very, very interesting. Uh, if you look at that here in our, in our winery, the clay amphoras are naked. These clay amphoras were buried. So we started to suspect that something was happening with this naked uh, clay amphoras. So uh, we had a, what we call <laughs> Uh, a, a, a black box. We, we knew what we had at first and we knew what we had later after the wine had been fermented and aged in, in, in the clay amphora. But we didn't know what was going on there. We have some hypothesis there, but we weren't sure about what was going on inside the, the clay amphora. So we joined a, a very interesting project here uh, called Gobal Mabin, the Plataforma Tecnológica del Vino in Spain which is an association of different wineries that we, we, which are stressing on research and development in, in, in the wine business. Um, the, the, the idea was to compare uh, all centennial clay amphoras with uh, new technological amphoras, also with uh, oaks, also with concrete, and to understand, as I, to, 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 as I was explaining before, what was going on inside this, this certain wear amphora. So uh, what we, we, we knew is that these wines uh, fermented and aged in clay amphoras uh, had some more freshness, more fruitness, more finesse, more expressivity. In the end, these tasting characteristics as floral aromas, more fruit, red or black, something very, very important. Depending on the clay amphora and depending on the terroir, uh, you could you could find different expressions of of, of the terroir in in, in the wine. Uh, some, for instance, when we, we we make some experiments also with Salguero, which is another plot from our our vines, and and the result was wow, red fruit. But for instance, talking about uh, El Buen Alfarero, which comes from El Hoyo Ornajo, another plot from our another terroir from our 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 vines. Um, it has to do more. It had to do more with uh, black fruit. Uh, so it de depended. I mean, on, on the terroir also. Deep and polished tannins, and uh, in the end, low astringency, great volume. In, in the end, it had to do more with uh, primary aromas than. Uh, of course, it had some complexity, but it was a different complexity. Not not in the way we tried. Uh, we talk about complex complexity once the the wine has been aged in oak. We were talking about some maybe. Uh, minerality, uh, but the, the main characteristic of these wines ha was that they, they had more primary aromas. They were younger than other wines aged in, in oaks. So uh, what we were thinking uh, of, or which was our hypothesis, that, I mean, the all centenary uh, amphoras, uh, centennial amphoras, sorry, um, they don't have vitrification inside. Um, in, in addition, they were naked in our winery. So there was, I mean, something related with porosity, with the oxygen permeation, which maybe could explain what we were uh, watching in, in this kind of, of, of wines. Um, of course, the, the, the question was, was clear, but what about the oak? I mean, in the end, the, the oak is also porous. Why, why the oak? I mean, uh, why don't we find this in the... Um, in, in, in the wine say you did oak, or, or at least why the different, which is the difference of, or, or where is the difference talking about this wine sage and fermented in oak 
in, in contrast uh, with those aged and fermented in, in clay amphoras. Um, well, um, in the end, well, this is something that everyone knows talking about wine. I mean, in, 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 in the clay amphoras, we have uh, a continuous micro oxidation during the process. In the egg, we have almost no oxidation. Uh, there are more primary aromas, as I was explaining before, underlining when talking about clay. In the oak, we have more toasted aromas, more the spices aromas. The, the wood are tannins, uh, and in, in, in the oak, the tannins are more polished. And if, I mean, the, explain, the explanation was that when the wood is wet, I mean, uh, it does not allow the oxygen to, to pass through. I mean, the, per the, perme the permeability becomes very, very low in, in oak. So this was a very important clue for us to understand why uh, this uh, winemaking in clay was so different as, as the results we had in, in oak. Um, as, I mean, as in clay, the, the water absor absorption is very, very low. The, the oxygenation rate uh, during the aging is, is higher in clay and lower in, in the oak. And this was something very important for, for us to, to understand because it helped us not only to produce a wine sayed in, in amphoras or fermented in amphoras, but to uh, mix these two uh, ways of, of aging and fermenting the wines. In some way, we, we realized that um, using clay was to take a picture uh, without no filter, no Instagram filter. Um, and using the oak in the end is like using some filters. And using some filters sometimes, sometimes uh, makes you uh, more handsome, but also in some way um, uh, makes you a little bit different. So making up the wine sometimes have some sense, but uh, if we were trying to, to stress on the pureness of the terroir, the clay was a huge step forward in that, dire in that direction. And in addition, we understood that it could go very well hand by hand with the oak in different stages of, of the of the agent of, of the aging the, the the wine. And another question, okay, what about concrete? Because concrete in the end is similar to clay, and that's right. Concrete, for instance, in our experience, works better than clay for white wines. But for red wines, uh, what we found in this case uh, was more interesting. Uh, the clay for, uh, I mean, we, the clay was more interesting than concrete for red wine, in, at least for our wines, of course, and for what we were looking for. Uh, there are some uh, issues that, that they are very similar about the coefficient, coefficient of permeability, uh, but also it depends on the, on the, the concrete composition, depends of, of the volume and, and, the, and, the, and the size of, 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 the, of the concrete uh, tank. But if, you, if we see this, this graph, we could see here is the different concrete tanks, and this is the oak. And in the end, the, this, is, this, has to, this had to do more with, with clay than when that than than with uh than with um oak but it wasn't so extreme as the as the as a clay uh so this was another important lesson we learned from from uh this project of, of, of global mavin and of course the, the final question we were in charge of analyzing uh also the, the different impact of traditional clay amphoras with the nowadays the technological uh, clay amphoras, and there was something very interesting here. The traditional centennial uh, amphoras, they had an inner coating to reduce porosity made of bee wax, almond oil, or even colophony. But the new uh, clay amphoras, uh, they have, I mean, the modern clay amphoras, they have uh, silicones or vitrification inside, which in the end reduce much more porosity than this natural inner coating that we had in, in the traditional and the traditional um, uh, clay amphoras. So this is an example of, of this technological amphora that, that I was uh, trying to, to explain, I was trying to, uh, to talk about, and this is our traditional amphora. Uh, of course, this has, this has to fulfill all the requirements of, of new, uh, I mean, uh, vessel um, for wines, I mean, and in the end of, uh, and in this case, they have to be, they have to use this, this vitrification. And in this case, for using this uh, clay, this all centennial clay amphoras, you are not allowed to use all of them. I mean, you have to, first of all, to show that this, this uh, clay amphoras were built for uh, wine in this case. And also that, of course, that the wine you produce inside this clay amphoras 
uh, the analytics of these wines also uh, also fulfill all the requirements of, of uh, Spanish, I mean, not only Spanish, but the European Union and uh, world trade in this case uh, requirements to 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 sell this this uh, wine as food as as a, as a food as we, as we consider it in in Spain um, but the results were 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 very very different and the the, the, the reason was this uh, at the end of the day uh, when you use the technological clay amphora in comparison with the traditional clay amphora all the exchange of oxygen that they have is very very similar but there is a huge difference in the first days of, of fermentation and aging in, in, in the clay amphora, and the, in the traditional clay amphora. There is a, a bigger in exchange of oxygen in this clay amphora. In, uh, in addition, it's a very, it's a like a kind of micro, a continuous micro oxygenation. And this really makes a difference because, a uh, difference, sorry, because uh, this higher oxidation in the earlier stage translate into the wine into a more stable bonds between tannins and antocians and this is what makes uh the wine yeah, in... sorry this uh this is what makes uh the wine to increase longevity longevity it gives more fruit flavors to the wine more primary aromas and even what makes the, text, the texture in 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 the mouth very very uh pleasant and very very soft very silky uh, something which is very interesting as i was explaining before we released uh, to the market El one alfarero 2016 uh very quickly because we were told that that wine was going uh uh to evolve uh, very very quick but uh a couple of weeks ago phone us from uh, Benin once more uh, trying they want they, because they wanted to to try again the wine the 2016 because surprisingly the wine uh, uh, is still improving in the bottle and nowadays uh, of course the primary aroma is still there but we can find more complexity in terms maybe of more balsamic more minerality uh, it's something very 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 interesting but uh when I told you uh, when I started my my lecture, I was telling you that in Spain there were lots of 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 clay amphoras. But what we are very proud about is that these clay amphoras weren't in Ribera del Duero. We had to look them for them in different places of of Spain. We had to do a kind of archaeology, like if we were in Indiana Jones. We have to unbury them to bring them to the winery. Uh, this is why I was explaining before. This is this is one of our clay amphoras. Uh, once it has been unburied. But as you saw in our winery, it was naked, but here it was surrounded of of this of this sand, and this is what maybe was uh, doing that. I mean, the, the, it was no, it was no possible to make this exchange of oxygen in the same way that we are doing it in our winery, and this is why maybe the, most of these traditional wineries that were using this clay amphoras. We're thinking that this wine evolves very quickly because without this exchange of oxygen and also without the the tannins that the the oak adds to the wine, these wines uh, didn't have enough muscle, uh, enough uh, skeleton to to bear a long aging in the bottle. And this is why maybe they 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 were uh, filling down quicker than other wines from from different appellations. And this is our this is nowadays our our. <laughs> room of clay amphoras we have 31 uh, clay amphoras producing wine with different parts of of, of spain we have a small ones uh, from 70 liters a bigger the biggest um, the size of the biggest is around 4500 liters with different clay composition we are still learning about about this because they are unique unique pieces uh, i mean every craftsman uh, every artisan i mean uh made unique uh, uh, works and unique clay amphoras in, in this case so although they are more or less similar uh, as i was trying i was i was underlining we keep on learning every every vintage and uh, this is very interesting because uh, when i was explaining that this was like taking a picture without any filter uh, this is maybe the best uh, vessel to identify the difference of it, each vintage in, in the wine. This is where, in this amphora, this is where you can find uh, the properties of the freshness of, of a vintage or the concentration of another vintage. And this is, this is very, 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 very interesting. Um, 
but for me, the most important thing is not, um, as I also was saying at, at the beginning of, of the lecture, is not okay that we, we released the one Alfarero. Okay, this is, this is great. This is <laughs> one of my favorite wines in, in the winery. But the most important thing for me is that uh, working in clay amphoras has helped us to improve other wines. Other wines that in some cases had been, uh, uh, I mean, had been living in the market for many years. This is the case, for instance, of Elite. Elite is one of our flagships in the winery in terms of, of uh, journalists, in terms of prescription. Uh, it's one of uh, our wines with best ratings. And uh, since 2017, 30% uh, of this wine ages uh, uh, some, I mean, three, four, five months, depends on in, 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 in Centennial Earthenware Amphora. Uh, Adaro, Adaro is a, a way to honor my grandfather. This is my grandfather. Uh, was also, a, a, I mean, a, an organic wine from a very special plot, but aged in, uh, in, in oaks and um, like, I mean, uh, other Rivera del Duero. But we decided that uh, every vintage, 40, 50% of the final blend uh, would have to, to, to age the, again, three, four, five month, months, depending on, on the vintage in, in, in Amphoras. And once more, uh, I think these two wines have improved a lot. Uh, origin, uh, this is the new, I mean, uh, is the wine who, which has substituted the, the Prado Rey Roble. And uh, I mean, it's something, uh, it's a, a wine that we are very proud because we're still producing about 1 million bottles of this wine, 10% of the final blend I spent some time in, in, in clay amphoras. The wine is much more funny. It's, it's, I mean, it's a fresher wine uh, and, and we are selling better and better every year because I think that uh, the wine is easier to drink. Um, you don't need to, as we used to say in, in, in Spain, you don't need to eat a, a sirloin to drink a glass of wine, in this case from, from Rivera del Duero. And this is a good example. Uh, and finally, Señor Niño. Señor Niño, was an experiment that we did in 2015. It was uh, the first, I think, the first carbonic maceration wine in Rivera del Duero, like in Beaujolais, same style of producing this, this wine. But we didn't, we didn't uh, make it very well in 2015. And once we realized uh, the potential of, 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 the, of the vessel of the clay amphora, um, we decided that we could try again to produce this wine. But once the, the carbonic maceration has been finished, aging the wine for a couple of months in, in, in clay amphoras. And it was a huge success, a huge success. We were very happy. The first vintage we produced this wine was 2018. And it's a, I mean, it's a very, very interesting wine, organic, even fresher than Prado Rio Origen, and in which we can see also that the, 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 the change that in this case, the clay amphora has uh, made in, in, in the carbonic maceration. I don't know whether in Beaujolais there is anyone doing something like, like this, but uh, for us in Spain has been a, a huge improvement for this kind of, of, of wines. Anyway, I like saying that our best wine, best wine is yet to come because at this moment we are a young team with uh, people with a lot of passion trying to do our best to explore our limits. And we have a new range of wine um, coming soon in, in the winery, uh, also spending some time in, in clay amphoras. And as I was trying to explain before, this is not about a fashion, this is not about a trend. This is about uh, making wines with soul and trying to put into value the only thing that makes us different, which is our terroir, our history, and this uh, beautiful place called Real Sitio de Ventosilla. So thank you so much. And of course, I'm at your uh, disposal. If you have any, any question, it will be a pleasure to, to answer them. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much, Fernando. So let's have the questions. Do the audience have questions? I, 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 on my end, I was very surprised about your Blonde Noir uh white wine that's mm -hmm. very interesting so it's from uh tempranillo it's white from tempranillo or what was the grape 
Uh, it's uh, Tempranillo, but I mean the, 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 the red Tempranillo, <laughs> not, not the white Tempranillo, because we have also white Tempranillo in Spain, not in Ribera del Duero. Yes, but it's a blonde uh, one, so it's a black. Yeah, uh, the, the... yeah okay. that, that's right, that's right. Uh, so uh, it's a very challenging wine for us uh, because um, we use, um, uh, I mean, a, a very rare kind of Tempranillo called Elite. It's a very rare uh, clone of, uh, of Tempranillo in Ribera del Duero. Okay. With lots of lots of concentration. Um, I mean, what we do is, I mean, uh, when we squeeze the grape, we immediately remove the must. We try to uh, have any contact between the, the, no the must of <laughs> no contact. That's right. That's right. And uh, well, after that, we, we bring some leaves from uh, from Rueda, from Verdejo, and we, we okay. make an aging in, in Verdejo lease for three months. And then an aging in, in American Oaks uh, for another nine months. And okay, finally, wow. the, wine, the wine spent one more year in the bottle. And this is very interesting because uh, um, in the end, I mean, it, 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 you, you realize that this is not a, a typical white wine, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is something that uh, the, the volume could bring you to a Rivera del Duro. It's a, a very interesting wine for pairing with different foods, for instance. Um, but I mean, if you see the color or just smell the, the, the wine, you wouldn't say this is a Blanc de Noir. I mean, it's, it's not uh -huh. that easy to find this, uh, red fruit. In fact, you, you can find some floral aromas and, and some, some white fruit, not, not, not red fruit. So it is very, very, very interesting. Uh, and of course it's very difficult to produce. We only, uh, you... release 5,000 bottles every year. Okay. Okay. Excellent. And you don't have white uh, grapes in uh, in Prado Rey, right? You only well, you only we are growing. Yeah, we, we, we well at this moment we have, we have changed that. We are growing at this moment. Well, we started growing Albillo in 2013, and okay. in fact, uh, we had also some uh, some um, a wild Albillo. Uh, and we use that wild albillo in El Buen Alfarero. Uh, five percent of El Buen Alfarero is with uh, I mean, it's made of wild albillo. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, wild wild albillo. I mean, and mm -hmm. in 2013 we started growing uh, some organic albillo. Okay. And in 2020 we started growing more albillo and recovering also rojal, which is a kind of moscatel, but typical from Ribera del Duero, that it was almost extinguished here extinguished. in, in Ribera del Duero. Oh, yeah. That's interesting to have old grapes. Uh... Mm. And also we, we have recovered uh, some prophylaxeric vines of albillo, uh, that, that they are very, I mean, they are close to our, our winery. And this is one of our most interesting projects. I hope we will have the chance to talk about it maybe next year. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you very much for the explanation. So do we have questions uh, for Fernando? Um, I have a question. Yes, are you, please, Michelle. Are you currently in the United States? And if so, which states? Well, we are currently in the United States. And well, my, my mates here in, in, I mean, I don't know whether you see the, the picture here. Uh, we have some importers in, in, in New York, New Jersey, I think that we are close to starting Massachusetts. We have also some importers in California, in Oregon, um, Illinois. I mean, uh, but at this moment we have lots of states free, and we are looking for new importers in in United States. So I don't know whether you can see here this uh, that my my mate's email. Yes, but, um, in yeah. the, sorry, on, on the booth. Uh, Michelle, you can reach the booth and you'll see all the free uh, states. Okay. In oh, okay. Very good. Okay. Very good. Excellent. So you're very welcome. Thank you so much. And do you have, um, this is for your enologist. Do you have plants? You have everything. If you have, uh, I don't know if albillo can be uh, uh, vinified as the orange wine. You know, you have the clay, yeah. you have yeah. the albillo yeah. yeah. to make an orange wine. That would be very interesting. Uh, this is this but is this the new pro uh, this is the new project I was I was telling you before. <laughs> Maybe we can oh, talk okay. about it next year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because uh, it's an orange wine, and in addition, we have also uh, made an experiment with uh, oaks from sherry, from Jerez. Ah, 
Interesting. And this is this is very 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 interesting. But uh, the potential of this wine maybe is uh, I mean for aging a long time. At this moment, this wine was made in 2018, and we don't see really we don't see ourselves releasing this wine before 2023. Of so uh, it needs uh, lots of time. But we think that we have a jewel with with Albillo. Um and this is this is challenging for us because we have never we have never I mean we we tried to make some video in 2017, but uh, we failed. I mean we we I mean the 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 the, the wine got oxidated into the into the clay amphora. Ah okay. Uh, <laughs> so we we learned about that, <laughs> and but at this moment we are very I mean uh, happy and and hopeful with with this new Albillo. So. I, I keep my fingers crossed, but maybe next year we we, can, we will have a surprise with that. I'm sure you will. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. So do we have more questions for Fernando? Yes, me and Juan. Go ahead, Pascal. OK, hello. Hello, Fernando. Fernando, hello. First, thank Fernando. you for all this sample. Uh, congratulations for the 93 points with Wine Spectator. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, I have a nice discussion with uh, one of your sellers. Uh, we call him Johnny. It's the American name, but I think it's Jem. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, I was impressed because he told me, Pascal, for, if you want to make money, let's go. Because the wine is in the USA. So if I understand, you import the wine. And if I'm a distributor in Florida, everywhere, is it possible to start with you with only 15 cases, for example, for test the, the market? Yeah, that's right. Uh, we are working with USA One Wine West. I mean, we were uh, working with uh, bigger importers some years ago, uh, mm -hmm. but it was very difficult to, to work with them with uh, for us because, I mean, in the end, they have maybe 2,000 uh, wines in, 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 the, in the list. And I, I can remember a few years ago, I was trying to. We were trying to make some incentive trips with uh, for the sellers to Spain, and 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 I remember that the the commercial director of of, of this importer uh, told me that Fernando, that's great, but this this uh, company of champagne, I won't say the name, uh, is going to give my my seller uh, some special tickets for Super Bowl. So okay, <laughs> I can't compete with that. So uh, in the end, we're trying to. To look for, uh, I mean, these distributors that can uh, work with us hand in hand, and that's right. I mean, we have the wine there, and you can start working with us. Uh, just asking for 15 cases, 10 cases, 20. I mean, of course. And in addition, we have three uh, people working there in in in, in USA. Of course, mm -hmm. this last year, due to the pandemic, they they haven't been able to to travel to United States, but uh, their mission is to spend. Uh, all the time they can spend in the United States because it's the most important market for us nowadays. Uh, this is the market we want to stress more. And yeah, that's right. You can start with with a small amount of cases with us. Yeah, it's perfect. Thank you for this answer because I know each time I have the chance to introduce your wine. I remember in Canada, for example, mm -hmm. immediately uh -huh. you receive an order. So the people are so happy to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You You're for... very kind. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there is no more questions, we will end this uh, very nice lecture. I really liked it very much. And so let's keep on with our round of conferences. Gracias, Fernando. Un saludo. Muchas gracias. Thank Un you so much. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. This will be recorded, huh? we will send a replay. Thank you.